Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Policy Beats. Today we have here a special guest from Russia. Mr. Fyodor Lukyanov is a research director at International World Eye Discussion Club. He is editor-in-chief of Russia and Global Affairs magazine and is chairman of Council on Foreign and Defense Policy. He is a member of the Presidium of the Russian International Affairs Council. Thank you so much, sir, for taking out the time for this podcast. I hope you're doing well and enjoying your time here in Pakistan. Oh, very much. Thank you for inviting me. And this is my first visit. Uh, I did not uh, see uh, much yet, but what I saw was very impressive. Thank you very much. I hope that your visits to Pakistan continue because in general the Pakistani community is always very intrigued by Russia and Russia's culture as well. And that makes perfect sense because we've seen uh, the sort of history that Russia carries. So, uh, you, know, you know, we are all, also intrigued by Russia sometimes. <laughs> don't understand everything what is happening. <laughs> That's understandable. But, I mean, therein lies why we would you know, want to understand uh, one of each other's countries better. And if you look at it, Pakistan and Russia, the discussion always seems to be quite mysterious, it always feels very novel to discuss this particular, um, you know, facet when it comes to international relations or geopolitics in general. So I have some questions that I feel like some of our audience members, layman members, who would be interested to know more about Pakistan, Russia. But just to sort of, you know, as an introductory question, how do you feel when we discuss Pakistan-Russia relations, given the history everyone likes to talk about? You know, we start off from USSR and back then when Pakistan was uh, part of the opposite side, right? Um, but right now things have changed. So in your perspective, where exactly are the relations headed and why so much mystery around it? Uh, first of all, uh, I wouldn't call it mystery. Maybe uh, we just try to romanticize the atmosphere a little bit to feel better. Uh, I'm old enough to remember uh, last um, uh, episode, last uh, section of the Cold War. And uh, frankly, I remember two things about Pakistan from that time. One positive, one negative. Mm -hmm. The negative was, of course, Afghanistan war, where Pakistan was uh, staunchly on the other side. But uh, on the positive um, uh, equation, I remember that in the Soviet Union, despite the Cold War and despite pretty uh, tense relationship, we had a brand, uh, the Paki Pakistani shirts, mm -hmm. Pakistani textile, was very highly evaluated as a very good quality. Unfortunately, I don't think we have it now, but at that time we had it. So Pakistan was all, has always been a part of, uh, of our horizon. Uh, you're right, everything changed since that, uh, despite the fact that some people now try to portray the current international system as another Cold War. Mm -hmm. But uh, from my point of view, it's completely wrong. All right. And this is misleading because, mm -hmm. okay, it looks like the Cold War in many aspects. Another question between whom? Is it U.S.-Russia again or is it U.S.-China mm -hmm. or is it uh, free world against something else? But in fact, the uh, comparison is, is misleading because the Cold War was uh, such a unique um, situation in the history of international relations when uh, the whole international politics was actually very well shaped, very well organized. Yes, on the confrontational basis, mm -hmm. but it was more or less predictable. One camp, another camp, and then you have rules of the game, which uh, are based on deterrence, on, on, on uh, terror, on horror, but still it worked. It's absolutely not the case today. We don't have camps anymore. The only camp which is remaining is the West. The West is a camp, that's for, for sure. But all the rest is not, no, no, no one wants now to build a new camp. Uh, no one wants binding uh, uh, obligations. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, this is the, the main difference, that yes, there is the United States and uh, allies. They uh, got used to the international hegemony since the end of the Cold War. Mm -hmm. I understand them as a human being, so it, it's so comfortable and great to be the, the boss. But situation changed, and now they try to 
to keep this uh, uh, dominance, while the whole world outside the West, they don't want it. It does not mean that everybody is trying to, uh, to fight against the West as Russia does now. But no one wants uh, Americans or Europeans to prescribe uh, what to do. And in this regard, coming back to your question, I think that relationship between any countries outside the West, including Russia and Pakistan, are based on the understanding that we need to use all opportunities mm -hmm. the international system offers, not to reject any of them because of ideology, because of geopolitical bias or what else. So in this regard, I think that, of course, given a uh, pretty complicated situation in Asia, in the South Asia, uh, there is not that easy, but I'm absolutely sure that relationship will be developed very actively. So it's interesting because, as you mentioned, that now there's only the West camp. And from what it feels like is that they're c trying to, you know, sort of push that dominance. They want that dominance to retain, especially when analysts and other others came up with the idea of the rising Asian century. So it seems to be a pushback towards that sentiment or that notion. Uh, on that note, what I would like to understand is the element of Russia-China partnership with regards to Pakistan as well, of course, in the later part of my question, I'll ask you that. But when when we see the Russian and Chinese partnership come together, a lot from the Western side argued that this rapprochement would not last long because there's a bifurcation of the world order and we are seeing the Cold War and that Russia would not like to be the junior to China. Your thoughts on this? You know, th this is exactly typical Western thinking. Mm -hmm. Uh, somebody is senior partner uh, and all others are junior partners. That's what we see inside the uh, Western camp. It's not good, it's not bad, it's just a tradition, just mm -hmm. a strategic tradition. Oh, right. uh, in Asia, of course, uh, we face uh, very different countries, different kind of countries, bigger, smaller, different cultures, different religions, different traditions. Uh, but I don't see here uh, any kind of hierarchy to emerge. Mm -hmm. uh, if we take Pakistan, of course, I'm not a specialist. I'm looking from the outside. But uh, Pakistan has a very good relationship with China. Does it mean that Pakistan is part of Chinese camp? Exactly. I doubt. I doubt. It's not. Because Pakistan's interests are much wider than just the relationship with China, although China is extremely important uh, to exactly. all neighbors. Yeah. And that's why I think that uh, the future development will be, uh, again, much less regulated and much less predictable than uh, we uh, had during the Cold War and after the Cold War, during the attempt to establish the American uh, leadership, American supremacy in the world. But it does, not, it, it does not necessarily mean conflict between those who are on, on place. Uh, no doubt, in, in Asia, you have China, you have India, very complicated relationship. You have India-Pakistan, you have North Korea-South Korea, you have Chinese claims uh, about uh, uh, territory, South China Sea, and many other countries are unhappy. There is Japan, and so on. This is, of course, uh, traditionally seeing a precondition for a big conflict. But I, I would dare to, to suggest that, this ex that that's exactly the opposite. The more concrete co uh, conflicts not necessarily connected to each other, the more opportunities for flexible oh, right. uh, equation building, not a big equation, not a big balance, but uh, balance case by case balance, which is not easy, which is pretty uh, sophisticated and risky, but this is the world, uh, how it will look like in the future. We will not be back to the Cold War time, because in, uh, to some extent it would be a great achievement to get <laughs> back to that very stable system. No way, so forget about this. And I think that in this situation, and I mentioned that uh, recently uh, talking at a conference here in Islamabad, to some extent, Pakistan and Russia, with a completely different experience uh, mm -hmm. in the past, 
But both countries experienced so many turbulences exactly. that we are better situated to survive in such an environment. I absolutely agree to that. In fact, I think Pakistan and Russia too have been resilient uh, in the face of turbulence. And that is perhaps why Pakistan is also attempting to reorient its relations um, under the ambit of geoeconomics as we try, even though currently there's some sort of, you know, political economic um, you know, obstacles that the country is facing, but nevertheless, a resilient country is bound to step out from those. So on, on that note, because Pakistan too, uh, un, you know, in line with the national security policy that it had, uh, that recently the NST had, um, you know, showcased, uh, it argued that countries within the region need to be looked at from a geoeconomics perspective. And that is also where Pakistan believes that it should interact with Russia. But sometimes I feel that the relations are still pretty much um, narrowed down to the energy security uh, part of the relationship where we're just talking about the oil supply. And then, like you said, that there's no longer the element of textile. Uh, mm -hmm. Those yeah. shirts no longer in Russia. So that's, that's a point on Pakistan to perhaps rethink then. Uh, but then again, I would like to understand from you when it comes to Russian foreign policy or rather economic policy, when looking at South Asia, Asia, what are the sort of factors that you're looking into when engaging with Pakistan uh, on the economic front? You know, to, to answer this question, I need to uh, make a very short uh, intervention on the general situation of Russia. It should be understood everywhere, in Pakistan in particular, mm -hmm. that Russia is going through an extremely deep and uh, pretty painful transformation. What happened last year, that was, of course, a big shock. Right. We are very happy that Russia managed to withstand and mm -hmm. resilience uh, proved to be quite big. But still, uh, contacts, economic ties, very, very well uh, developed economic ties with traditional partners, mm -hmm. which were extremely uh, uh, profitable for both sides, they were just cut in one day, basically. Right. If somebody could tell me uh, uh, February 22nd mm -hmm. uh, last year that by the end of the last year, energy relationship between Russia and Germany will uh, uh, would cease to exist, I would never believe that. But it happened. But it happened. And what, what is uh, happening now inside a Russian economy, there is a adaptation to the completely new situation First, uh, looking for other partners, and in this regard, it's very positive uh, also for Pakistan and for South Asia. But at the same time, there is another process, the internal reshuffle of the economic structure, of exactly. the economic si system, which was based very much on cooperation with, uh, with Europeans and Americans. Mm -hmm. That means, again, partially to, to find new partners, but partially to... Uh, vitalize or revitalize domestic production, domestic forces, as we call it, uh, maybe not the best word, the import substitution. Right. And uh, that means that uh, it might be two ways of cooperation. One way, the easiest one, as you mentioned, energy security, maybe food security. Uh, it's not that uh, simple now because of uh, economic warfare uh, mm -hmm. from the side of the West against Russia. And of course, Americans, they are not stupid. They, they watch very clearly who cooperates with Russia and they put pressure on countries, exactly. including Pakistan. Uh, but still, this is what we actually know how to do, bypassing and so on. Another thing, which is more complicated, but uh, maybe more important uh, also, to find... Uh, cooperation, for example, in manufacturing, mm -hmm. because Russia needs to rebuild its industry. Uh, and there are countries which we never uh, considered as, as important partners before, but now they come as such partners. Who could imagine a year ago that North Korea would be a quite a exactly. significant part of Russian economic relationship or Iran? But now we see that we were uh, all too, uh, too, uh, too arrogant before. Now we see that many countries have something to offer 
Pakistan certainly has something to offer to us. Pakistani, uh, not only industry, but uh, also science and high technology, as we know, is quite developed, maybe quite, quite unequally as in Russia as well, but still. And I think that after this period of uh, adaptation, we will find much more space for cooperation, including quite sophisticated level. All right. And so from that, perhaps it may sound repetitive, but then I would ask you then how does Pakistan-Russia relationship then impact the regional stability given we've got issues of Afghanistan and we've got the India-Pakistan issues on Kashmir and also, you know, largely on other Central Asian countries as well? Uh, first of all, of course, India is a big, is a big uh, issue here and is a big issue for us. Uh, India is a very important partner of Russia, exactly. no doubt about that. We have very long tradition of relationship. During the Cold War, when Pakistan was rather on other side, India was maybe not on the Soviet side, but strictly in between. Uh, and I don't think that um, uh, Russia one day will conclude that India is not important. India will be important for everybody. But having said that, I don't think that... Uh, based on what I said earlier about mm -hmm. this new world where, where everybody is looking for all opportunities. Exactly. India is uh, moving clearly just now towards the United States for, for its own reasons. It's not, it, it has nothing to do with Russia, but they do it. Uh, Russia, of course, will do everything to preserve ties with India, but there are certain limitations. Of course. Uh, Indians are very jealous when they see Russia uh, engaging with Pakistan, but it's exactly the same. That why if if you have a variety of choices, we we have uh, uh, as Long well choices to make. Uh, in this regard, I think that Russia Russian diplomacy will be smart enough to find a, a way to to work with uh, both sides. And of course, Russia would be extremely interested to improve relationship between, to see improvement of relationship between India and Pakistan and the invitation of both countries to Shanghai Cooperation Organization exactly. was intended to help this. I wouldn't say it contributed much yet, but we'll see. As for Afghanistan, uh, this is a big issue for uh, our neighbors in Central Asia. Uh, we have excellent professionals who know Afghanistan very well, both in the foreign ministry, in the intelligence community. And probably I would dare to say that there are two countries who understand Afghanistan best. There are Pakistan and Russia. Uh, if we talk to Americans, we see that they have, as, 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 as frequently, they have their own view, which has not so much to do with reality. And I think that uh, we have differences on, on, Pakistan, on Afghanistan, of course, but in the, in, in the bottom line, this is same interest mm -hmm. that Afghanistan survives and develops. We, as you, have no big uh, uh, claims how Taliban should rule their country. And this is the basic assumption in Russia. We don't interfere in other countries' internal affairs. But, of course, everybody is interested that they uh, would deliver mm -hmm. to the population in all senses. Uh, it's not easy, as we see. Now uh, I follow as uh, just a person who follows international relations. Of course, I'm very uh, interested in this process of uh, returning uh, Afghani uh, uh, refugees to, from Pakistan. I understand actually why Pakistan is doing that, but it can bring a couple of troubles for exactly. to Afghanistan. Mm. Uh, but uh, at the end of the day, I think that we will find uh, common ground much easier than uh, some other countries do. All right, because uh, recently the special representative on Afghanistan from Pakistan had also given a statement on one of our annual events regarding the recognition element whereby Russia and other countries would not do it unilaterally until and unless certain lines and are acknowledged by the Afghan government and some actions are on display and would the regional consensus that process uh, would somehow um, take ground. So, no, uh, if, if I may, uh, all of us know how difficult it is to work with Taliban. Exactly. <laughs> 
and uh, probably uh, many would prefer different kind of government there. But what to do? This is the government exactly. which is I there, mean, and they they control the country and they enjoy pretty significant support. That's their. And again, uh, Pakistan is really just facing the brunt of all that's happening in Afghanistan. There's a famous saying here that if Afghanistan catches a cold, Pakistan sneezes. Mm. So <laughs> that's pretty common if you go around here. People will tell you that often. So moving on to the other regional heavyweight, which, well, not that Afghanistan was a heavyweight, but rather a heavyweight of turbulence. But moving on to China, that is currently a regional heavyweight in the region. How do you see this sort of relationship influencing Pakistan-Russia relations because Pakistan hosts the biggest uh, BRI project, the CPEC. And how do you see Russia, you know, is there anything for Russia in it? You know, I don't see, frankly, uh, what kind of uh, impact uh, China can have on uh, Russian-Pakistan relationship. As, as we discussed earlier, Pakistan is not uh, just... Uh, 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 continuation of China, mm -hmm. uh, Pakistan has uh, uh, its own interest and uh, uh, very close relationship with China, but this relationship of two different countries. Uh, China is a much bigger factor in Russian relationship with India, that's for sure. For one simple reason, that Indians are extremely... Uh, unhappy to see Russian-Chinese rapprochement mm -hmm. because they interpret this as a threat to them. I don't think they are correct in this interpretation, but that's how they see it. As for uh, Belt and Road Initiative and uh, other pro projects, you know, Russia uh, has always supported this uh, mm -hmm. project, but Russia uh, never uh, voiced any um, uh, willingness to join, to participate. We don't need it. It's it's Chinese uh, Chinese pro uh, project with many countries, but with uh, we have with China a different kind of relationship. Uh, Belt and Road Initiative, which uh, certainly is a very important factor, both in Asia and probably even now worldwide, but as any big project, it has both advantages and disadvantages with those participating. And I think that just now, both Chinese and uh, uh, their partners, uh, they uh, understand this dialectics. So uh, this project certainly will be developed, but uh, I don't see how Russia, Russian relationship with countries in the region might be challenged by this, frankly. I don't, I don't think it will happen. All right. My f final concluding questions to you, well, one of them is my favorite, and I asked you that earlier in the day as well, and I would like if you could expand on it a little more. But before that, of course, I would ask you what would be the future prospects that you could outline for Pakistan-Russia relations? And the other question, of course, um, is on, you know, understanding today's geopolitical tensions from, should we, in fact, understand it from the lens of civilization versus nation states concept because we've been seeing that sort of discourse come in quite a lot um, where we're seeing China, Iran, India, Russia, uh, and even Turkey do somewhat, I mean, analysts are putting these as the face uh, when it comes to these discussions. You know, uh, uh, the civilization concept or this so-called civilizational approach uh, which is pretty deep-rooted both in Russian political or intellectual culture and mm -hmm. in Western as well, starting from Toynbee and Spengler and so on. Uh, it's a very interesting intellectual tradition. When it comes to practical uh, policy making, uh, this concept is pretty vague, so it's not that easy to explain exactly. what do you mean when you call as uh, the concept of Russian foreign policy now, uh, Russia is called a unique uh, uh, civiliza state civiliza civilization state. Civilization state, yes. Yeah. Uh, I try to be as practical as possible, and I interpret this uh, emerging concept actually as a symbol, as a, as a sign of uh, crisis and decline of the previous universalist system. 
because what we had before, not just during the American supremacy, but even before, mm -hmm. during in, in, in 20th century, in exactly. the earlier, that was Western idea about universalism mm -hmm. as, a, as a model, which uh, step by step uh, came, came up. And that was the culmination was the uh, unipolar world as we had after the Cold War uh, when Americans were at the top. Now it's over. It's over, but no one knows exactly what will come next. Mm -hmm. And I think that this uh, intellectual quest for civilization means more that that's a search. It's not a result. Right. And in this regard, I think uh, intellectually and maybe even politically, it's very interesting. I don't think this is a final destination. But since we are in a very transitory uh, phase of international development, many ideas would come up, including this one, maybe others. And what is, what is obvious everywhere, not just here or in Russia or somewhere in Africa, everywhere, that countries try to preserve their, uh, their legacy, which can have different implications, positive exactly. and negative. Mm. But this is the trend of the time, the zeitgeist. And in this regard, uh, we just as, as researchers especially, we need to, to study this and to try to minimize negative sides and maximize positive ones. Exactly. Well, thank you so much um, for taking out the time and joining us in this conversation. Pakistan-Russia relations remains an important subject of study for people on, on both sides, and I hope we continue to work together, engage and cooperate and find new avenues where, uh, you know, scholars like yourself and young aspiring scholars like myself can get the chance to learn from each other. With that being said, thank you so much for watching this episode. I will see you again on another episode of Policy Beats.